Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Second Gen's Liberated Panda. Today, we have a very special guest. His name is Ma Rei Xing, or Nisan Mabubi. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, your profession, and the CSCC podcast? For more on the event, I'm joined now by Nason Mabubi. He's an expert on Chinese law and a research scholar at the University of Pennsylvania Center for the Study of Contemporary China. <laughs> Quite an introduction. Welcome to the broadcast. Tell us, what tone did Thank the you, plenary Susan. session set, specifically the anti-corruption drive for the upcoming 19th National Congress? So uh, this plenary session occurred over the last few days and just concluded, and the report just came out this morning. Uh, it's not a very open meeting, so we don't know a lot about it, but um, it sounds as if uh, anti-corruption was a major theme, and we know that that's been a major theme of uh, the first five years of uh, this, this uh, new administration. Um, so clearly that's going to continue and color the basic tenor of the party congress that's starting in a few weeks. Hi, Angel. Thanks so much for having me on, and thanks for uh, uh, referencing me by, by, by my Chinese name, Ma Rui Xin. I always like to, to hear that. Uh, so I'm a fellow at the Center for the Study of Contemporary China at the University of Pennsylvania and a lecturer at Penn Law School. And like you said, I, I host the podcast of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. Uh, so what should I say about myself? So I'm a legal scholar. Uh, my field is Chinese administrative law uh, with a particular focus on uh, Chinese administrative litigation, which is how people sue the government in China, and uh, Chinese administrative procedure reform which is uh, the way in which uh, law may serve to uh, constrain uh, official behavior in China. Um, I've also become very interested in, in the last few years in US-China relations. Uh, and uh, I think that's uh, something that's probably true of anybody who focuses on China, uh, given how fraught the relationship between the two countries has gotten over the last few years. Um, and so it's through that that I've, uh, uh, become, uh, I think, more active in some public discourse uh, through that interest. And uh, also at Penn, we have uh, this uh, project on the future of U.S.-China relations, uh, which I've been uh, co-organizing with my senior colleagues, Jacques Delisle and Avery Goldstein here at Penn. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned the podcast. So the podcast uh, is, a, is a third thing, uh, which uh, we've been doing for a few years now here at Base of the Center. Um, and is really uh, designed to be a way to uh, have conversations with guests and visitors uh, and also people at Penn uh, on Chinese uh, politics, economics, law and society, which are in depth and uh, I think uh, you know, longer than the usual, but give a chance to really air out some uh, deep points uh, and then, you know, share them with uh, broader broader audiences beyond simply academic ones. Uh, so that's basically me in a nutshell. Wow, that is very comprehensive. Sounds like you have your hands full. So I think you mentioned um, you're one of the project leaders for the Penn Project on the future of US-China relations. So in what areas related to China do you feel positive about moving forward? And then conversely, what areas related to China do you feel more negative about moving forward? You know, I think the way that I view it is that the U.S. and China are the world's two largest economies, and uh, both countries uh, have a shared interest in a degree of global stability uh, generally and also with respect to global trade. Uh, so anything that, uh, you know, has to do with ongoing stability of the global system um, and stability of the conditions for global trade is going to be an area in which the U.S. and China will have shared interests. Um, so it's not necessarily where they have to try to uh, work out areas of cooperation. They just will have shared interests, and that will inevitably lead them to find ways uh, in which those shared interests can be uh, pursued together. Um, and you know, the the types of issues that are often referenced in this area include questions like climate change, uh, public health. Um, but I think we could very easily add uh, issues that relate to the stability of the global financial system, uh, issues that relate to the WTO, uh, the conditions of global trade. I think on all of those kinds of issues, there's a lot of room um, for the U.S. and China to have productive 
uh, working relationship. Um, but of course, we also know, especially uh, lately, that uh, there are some things that the US and China don't see eye to eye on um, and that relate uh, in, in large measure to um, you know, China's increasing claims uh, that have to do with the South China Sea, um, its uh, actions in Hong Kong, um, some of the human rights uh, aspects that are domestic to China, but that seem to cross a threshold uh, beyond what Western countries um, can ignore. Uh, and so that would particularly be the treatment of the Uyghur population in Xinjiang. And, and this uh, ongoing concern about what China's intentions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan are. Uh, so each of those areas are, are areas that are increasingly fraught and tense. Um, and then on top of all of that, there is this notion that China is rising as an economic power more generally, um, and that that economic uh, competition with the US, uh, particularly the area of technology, but also more broadly, uh, is one in which um, you know, US national interests might, uh, might suffer. Uh, and so you know, that kind of you know, particularly tech-based economic competition um, is, is going to be an area of greater tension as well. Uh, you know, I think to sort of put a bow around all of this, there are some people who focus more on the areas of cooperation. There's some people who area focus more on the areas of confrontation. My view has been that we have to look at all of them, that you can't really only look at the areas of confrontation or only look at the areas of cooperation. They're all part of the same mix. And uh, one way or another, both countries are gonna have to work out a relationship going forward where the areas of confrontation are clear and delineated and addressed on their own terms, but the areas of cooperation are preserved and, and addressed as well as they can be as well. So that's, you know, it's not the easiest path forward, but I think it's the, it's the only choice we really have. So well, um, following up on that, what are like, what do you see as like some of the major misconceptions that um, like America and the Western uh, world has about China? That's a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that I think is a sort of a premise to your question, which I feel very uh, passionately about, is that um, as China becomes more important on the world stage, as things that happen in China affect uh, more people outside of China, and you know, there's all sorts of examples we can give to that, but it, particularly we think about the coronavirus pandemic. I think, you know, if you didn't think that Chinese governance was important to your daily life a year ago, you really should think it is important now. Um, and so as all of this happens, I think it's really incumbent upon Western audiences who have become lately more interested in China to really learn more about China. Um, so I think that that is really a, an important premise. Um, you really cannot uh, think about the uh, challenges posed by China's rise or the opportunities posed by China's rise unless you actually understand China. Uh, and so I really, um, you know, that's part of the reason that I've gotten more engaged in sort of public discourse. It's part of the theory of the podcast, the CSCC podcast, which is to make high-end thinking about China more accessible to broader audiences. Um, and so as I, you know, feel very strongly about this, so let me answer your question about some of the misconceptions. Um, you know, one, one kind of, I think, important misconception that uh, needs to be addressed is that, um, you know, I think there is a tendency to view uh, the Chinese daily lived reality as more, um, uh, you know, palpably and viscerally authoritarian or even totalitarian than it actually is. So I think you know, that's a dangerous misconception because then that can lead people to not see the ways in which the Chinese government actually does have legitimacy within China and does have a lot of popular support. Now, that doesn't mean we can't criticize the things that the Chinese government does that we think are problematic, which I think many of those things are. Um, and it also doesn't mean that we have to overlook the fact that there are many Chinese citizens who have complaints about the Chinese government, uh, which they express either through legal channels or through other kinds of advocacy. All of that's important. But to think that the daily lived reality in China for the vast majority of people, and of course we know that the situation of the Uyghurs um, and other ethnic minorities is increasingly difficult these days. I don't wanna you know, uh, misunderstand that or to be unclear about that. That is clear, but for you know, people living in the cities and the coastal cities and in many other parts of the country, the daily lived reality is in many ways not so different from the daily lived reality of people in our own society. So I think you know, any of our analysis from China has to start from that kind of understanding. 
Um, and you know, the broader point that I think my comment has just made is that it's complicated. You know, I think oftentimes in our discourse in the West, we like we like simplicity. We like things to be like, you know, it's either good or bad, black or white. And what I've learned in all these years of studying China is that there's nothing that's as complicated as China. You know, there's a lot of different things happening. There's a lot of different things happening in the society. There's a lot of different things happening in the economy. There's a lot of different things happening in the culture. And if we really do want to have a better understanding of how to work or compete with China going forward, we have to have a deeper understanding of all of those things. I completely agree with you. Um, what a wonderful answer. <laughs> and I guess um, in connection with understanding China more, I know one of your primary academic interests is uh, Chinese law. So now that there's more information available to us, um, there's like services like China Law Translate. I don't know if you've ever used Sure, I know that. you had Jeremy Daum on your show recently. Yes, yes, he, he was wonderful. And I think he provides a, a great service um, to us lawyers where we can just look at these legal documents, look at Chinese law in a way that we couldn't before. Sure. Um, so, you know, because we have such great um, services such as these, or the the most significant issues in Chinese law that are most prevalent in your opinion? You know, so what, what I think is interesting about Chinese law, the reason I first started studying Chinese law, even as an undergraduate in the, in the mid nineties, when I first started studying Chinese, I very quickly uh, decided that I was gonna focus on Chinese law in my career. And I've done that, you know, for all the years since. What, what is, you know, so compelling about Chinese law is that um, like in any society, law reflects the changes that are happening in a society and helps to shape them. And with China, you know, which is changing so rapidly across so many dimensions and has, uh, especially during this reform and opening period, all of that changes can be viewed through the lens of law and are reflected in law, shaped by law. So it makes Chinese law generally uh, a fascinating uh, lens on, on the story of China. Um, so you know, that's, that's what's driven my own sort of interest for so many years. And, and I think we are at a time now where there are lots of different resources, uh, including Jeremy Downs' great uh, China Law Translate project, including all the academics uh, like myself and many others who uh, work on Chinese law in different law schools uh, and outside of law schools. Um, there's, there's a lot now to be, uh, to be looked at. And I think also this is an area in which uh, Chinese scholars themselves um, have been uh, producing work that's accessible to uh, Western audiences, you know, even writing in English, so that there's also ways of accessing the work of Chinese scholars directly. On that uh, vein, I should mention, by the way, that at the University of Pennsylvania, we've been trying to promote greater understanding of Chinese administrative law, in part by publishing a set of volumes of the uh, journal, the Penn uh, Journal on Asian Law, uh, also known as the Penn Asian Law Review, uh, that are specific to Chinese administrative law and that feature authors who are Chinese administrative law scholars writing in English, but about their, their system. Um, so, you know, there are all of these different types of resources. And so to get to your real question, which is, you know, so for someone who's like, okay, great, you've convinced me that there's all these different resources now to look at it. What, what, why does this matter? Um, this is what I would answer. Number one, um, you know, we have to be, uh, you know, in the, in the favorite phrase of DC policymakers, we have to be clear-eyed about why the Chinese government uh, through the last 40 years has promoted uh, legal development. Uh, the reasons that they've promoted legal development are not always the reasons that you would think from the rhetoric. So if the rhetoric is rule of law, constraint of government behavior, you know, that's not necessarily the reason that's driven the, why the Chinese government has promoted this over the years. And especially under Xi Jinping, where the prevailing you know, ethos seems to be one of control of society. When the Xi Jinping administration talks about rule of law or building a you know, law-based state, it's not clear that that language is, you know, you should take it at face value. That said, when you use that language and you empower people within a society to be law professors, to be judges, to be lawyers, to be officials in a state that have a particular brief that has to do with law, you create something different from what the initial motivations of the state are. And that's what I find fascinating. The notion that regardless of what the motivation of the high level leaders was in generating sort of like this legal development, once it exists, once you have professors who come to the US and study American law or judges who get trained by you know, American uh, judges in supported by projects like the Ford Foundations or other training uh, things, you know, that creates a new thing. 
And, and so that's what I, I think is fascinating to see how uh, the law and legal language, um, legal thinking, uh, legal reasoning, the values that are embedded in law start to become more significant in, in, in a society uh, that may, you know, not start off from those points, but now that thing exists in the society. That's, that's why I think anyone should be interested in the story of Chinese law. So have you seen like any um, like changes, positive or negative in, in Chinese law, like in the past decade, let's say? Well, so what's been very interesting about the past decade and particular period under Xi Jinping is that um, when he first came into power uh, and the new administration came into power, there was a lot of uh, rhetoric that seemed to be emphasizing, uh, you know, greater judicial professionalism, um, seemed to be emphasizing a greater judicial autonomy, uh, seemed to be suggesting that law was really going to take on like a new importance. And in fact, the plenum, uh, the fourth plenum of the 18th Party Congress back in 2014 was known as the rule of law plenum because it was focused on, on law. And that decision that came out of that plenum, I don't know how much of your audience is really, you know, that uh, sort of focused on these kinds of, you know, high oh, level hy elite. Hyper focused. Hyper focused. So if you look yes. at that decision, there are lots of reform ideas, uh, you know, the, the, the full communique and then the full decision of that, of that plenum. There's lots of like long time reform ideas, legal reform ideas that are, that are in that, that, that are really, you know, if you care about having, you know, a more independent legal system, if you care about having greater restraint on government officials, if you care about having more judicial autonomy, all that language is in there. Um, what, what I think has been disappointing to a number of people is that notwithstanding all of that language and notwithstanding even some efforts for like the Supreme People's Court to give more authority to its uh, hearing officers, the judges, you know, both at the court level and the Supreme Court level and below, um, it seems as if some of the energy behind some of that effort has, has dissipated. And, and so now the, the emphasis is more on um, uh, control and uh, you know, judicial responsibility, telling judges not to make mistakes, things like that, rather than the initial set of ideas. Um, that said, uh, I, I am not, uh, you know, I, I tend to be somewhat optimistic by nature, but I think also um, in this case, it's true that some of the energy behind some of that early efforts that we saw in the Xi Jinping administration around rule of law development, some of that has dissipated and, and the trend has shifted towards other types of approaches, but that stuff still exists. And, um, you know, I think like with any kind of legal development, there's always going to be layers that build upon layers. So I don't think that the story is over is, is basically what I'm trying to say, that there are things that were, you know, done in the past 10 years in terms of creating a more professionalism among the judges, uh, starting to set up some standards about judicial autonomy from interference, um, starting to clarify some legal rules, you know, that stuff is going to continue to have an impact going forward. Right. And so we're hoping that uh, the Chinese law continues to evolve in a way that's like productive to society. So fingers crossed on that. <laughs> uh, so kind of shifting focus to- And just to, just to, you know, to emphasize one other point on that, you know, I think it's really important for Western audiences to understand that the actors that are trying to make that happen are on the ground in China, right? That whether or not that happens is not simply something that will be decided by the central committee. Whether or not, you know, these types of efforts continue to bear fruit and for the legal system to become more robust and for, you know, judges to have more independence and more autonomy is also determined by the actions of professors, lawyers, judges, officials in, in, in government agencies. And there's a lot of uh, you know, things to be optimistic about when you look at that picture, as opposed to just looking at the opinions of the Central Committee members. In interesting. So when you say uh, the players on the ground, are you referring to the internal players or are you seeing more like external players coming in as well? A little of both, right? But, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think in, in the Chinese phrasing, which I guess your audience would be very familiar with, it's like teacher nay and teacher what, right? The people who are within the system, people without the system. I would say all the people I just listed, whether they're professors, professors or judges, lawyers, officials, obviously are teacher nay, right? Mm -hmm. And, but I think that's the key point. That's, I think the thing that has driven my interest in China for such a long time is that there are clearly people who are count as teacher nay, who want China to develop in a direction where there's more predictability, 
uh, more fairness, more justice in the legal system, um, and who try to find ways to, to advance that reform agenda under whatever the political conditions from above are. That to me is very exciting. Now, of course, for them to do that, it helps to have people who are teacher Y, um, you know, putting pressure on the system as well. And if we thought about the development of Chinese law over the last 40 years, there are periods where the teacher Y people have been, you know, really helped to move things forward. Um, and then there's periods where the teacher Y people have gotten into more trouble, like legal activists who've, you know, fallen into like prison or been, you know, uh, exiled or whatever. And, and but that's a dynamic story. It's not a story that's over. Um, and it will continue to play out regardless of what's happening at the top level of politics. It, so just uh, like a little bit about my feedback on that. One of the things that uh, frightens me is if I were a Chinese lawyer in China and I were advocating for something, there's such a fine line between what I can say and what I can't say. And it's yeah. not always um, articulated and it's not always obvious. So the like I, I really admire these people, you know, because they are risking jail time, right? Because um, they have no idea what can get them in trouble and what you know what is legitimate and they're okay. So yeah, yeah so um, for you know, me so, personally, and this yeah. is just me personally, but for me personally, those kinds of people, the people uh, within the system and and the lawyers who we could say are maybe slightly outside of the system within China, who have a vision of creating more just and fair outcomes in China and are doing the best that they can to navigate within the system, who are conscious of their own vulnerabilities uh, if they cross certain lines, but who are pushing as far as they can under you know, changing and sometimes difficult conditions. Those to me are some of the most inspirational people in the world, right? And, and obviously there's lots of inspirational people in the world and some of those people you know, come out of the system because ultimately they can't keep uh, you know, pushing within the system. Um, and I, you know, I have all sorts of respect for those people as well. But I personally am particularly inspired by the people who try to figure it out within the system, because as you said, it's extremely difficult. Yeah. And you only do it if you really believe in trying to create more just and more fair outcomes, notwithstanding the difficulties. To me, you know, that's what's driven my interest in this area for such a long time, is being so inspired by people like that. Right, because you see that they want it too, right? It's not just us wanting it; they want it for themselves. So it's Absolutely. very inspirational, right? And it, it just right it motivates you, and it kind of like prompts you into action. <laughs> so um, and and I feel my role because obviously I'm not Chinese, and I'm obviously not you know on the ground in China. But my role, I think, in this picture is to try to you know tell people that that's happening, so that people have this broader, nuanced understanding of the dynamics in China. And then to be supportive in any way that I can be, you know, so if someone wants to know more about how something works in the US so they can inform their advocacy or their scholarship or whatever in China, I'm happy to do that because I'm so supportive of their general project. I love it because you're telling our viewers and you're telling me information that I didn't know. So uh, thank you for, you know, providing the nuance and providing more context into like this very complicated uh, situation between US and China right now. And if you can let me just add one more thing to this, this oh. is why I feel, and this is what has driven me into this area of thinking about US-China relations. Um, I think I think there are lots of people who play roles like I do. And uh, when US-China relations permit educational exchange, uh, permit collaboration on you know, shared issues that have to do with shared regulatory challenges, it permits these avenues of uh, discourse that can be sources of ideas and inspiration for, you know, Chinese actors on the ground. Um, so that's why I think that's what motivates my own um, participation and in, in activities that have to do with U.S.-China relations is understanding that, you know, if you if you break off contact, um, you're also depriving those people on the ground of like important source of oxygen, basically. So that's that's part of what drives. Uh, my interest in U.S.-China relations, um, having at least some space for these kinds of dialogues. That's so true. And do you see um, in recent years, there's been like a restriction on um, your ability to communicate with those players on the ground? Well, certainly there's been a restriction from the past year of COVID-19 of not being able right. to go to China. And so I think, you know, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is how long are those restrictions going to last and how important it is um, for you know people like me 
and my colleagues to start going back to China as soon as it's possible so that we can continue these dialogues in the most effective way possible, which is on the ground. I mean, obviously you can stay in touch with people in various ways um, with all these different technologies, but you know, especially given the difficulties of the Chinese system, uh, there's nothing that's more effective than being on the ground. Because also it's not just that it's easier to communicate with people, but when you, when you are on the ground, um, as a, you know, as, as a scholar, my understanding of what's actually happening is much more nuanced. I always feel uh, over the years, you know, I've tried to go as often as I can, um, when, but when there are periods where I haven't gone for a bit and, and my main diet of information is from abroad and through like Western news sources, it's, it's, it's not that it's inaccurate, it's just that it's only one slice of it. And so when you actually go on the ground, you get that broader picture, which is which is really um, important. Um, now, once the COVID restrictions are passed and we're actually back on the ground, yeah, there's definitely new uh, new constraints um, than before, um, and some of those come from the Chinese side, but some of those, frankly, also come from the U.S. side. Uh, and so, I think if if I have any sort of role in sort of public advocacy is to try to push back on those kinds of constraints. Um, to preserve the role that, you know, the dialogues that me and my Chinese interlocutors and our, you know, other interlocutors here in the West and in China can, can continue to do. So shifting focus, but also in connection with that, uh, what are your thoughts about the Biden administration's approach to China and his China policy? And if you were his advisor, what would you be advising him to, to do? So if, if, if I can uh, just plug, uh, we're actually going to do, I think this will probably appear before it. So if any of your listeners uh, are interested, we're going to do a panel um, at Perry World House at the University of Pennsylvania on April 20th on exactly this topic, on the Biden administration and U.S.-China relations. Uh, you'll be able to hear not only from myself, but also from Susan Thornton, uh, from Ryan Haas, who are both former government officials with a long time experience on U.S.-China relations, and Sheena Greidens, a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, who also has been uh, very prolific on these issues. So if, if this gets posted before April 20th, I highly recommend people to check out our panel. If you go to Perry World House, uh, you, can, you can register for it. Um, and, and that should be an interesting discussion, which will also be, be online. Um, you know, I think in, to preview what I might say <laughs> in, in that discussion uh, on April 20th, um, I, I think the Biden administration uh, is still working out their approach. Um, it's clear that there are a couple of broad points that they have settled on. So broad point number one is that they want to uh, engage allies more than was the case under the Trump administration. Um, point number two is that there are things about some aspects of the Trump administration's approach to China that they um, agree with and that mm -hmm. they are you know, not going to change. Um, and so what are some of those things? Uh, the uh, they haven't lowered tariffs yet. Um, they have maintained the designation of what's happening in Xinjiang as a genocide. Um, they continue to speak very um, sort of robustly about uh, what's happening in Xinjiang. Um, they've expressed, you know, great support for Taiwan. Uh, those are all things that for which there's a continuity with the Trump administration. But then the third thing is that they seem to be trying to lower some of the temperature around the rhetoric, um, you know, to not use as charged rhetoric. Uh, which has, I think, had lots of deleterious effects in general, but also with respect to, you know, the Asian American community uh, in the U.S., obviously, there's some connections there. So the rhetoric has been toned down a bit. And I think there is an interest in exploring the areas in which there can be cooperation, whether it's climate or public health, or maybe even the areas that I'm interested in, like, you know, legal exchange. Um, but I don't think they yet know exactly how to do that last part, you know. And I, so I think, they have these broad ideas, these broad principles, but they haven't quite figured out what is it going to be specifically they're going to do that's going to navigate all of these different types of things and whether allies really will be uh, part of that picture. I don't think they know yet. Um, so I think that's, that's what's going to be interesting to follow in the next period is if you say, okay, we understand you have this broad set of ideas about how you want to do things and how they're going to be somewhat similar, somewhat different from the Trump administration. But what specifically are you going to do that's different or that's, you know, how is, how is this, this what in theory is going to be a nuanced strategy? How is it going to be specifically operationalized? I don't think they know yet. Um, mm -hmm. But I do hope that as they're trying to figure out what to do, they, they do pay attention to the papers of our pen project on the future of US-China relations because there's a lot of pretty good ideas in there for, for that kind of thinking. 
No, absolutely. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about the um, Alaska Anchorage uh, meeting between China and the U.S. Uh, what did you think about the exchange between U.S. and China? I thought it was great TV, first of all, right? It was uh -huh. performative on both sides. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, I've said this also publicly in various interviews. I think that uh, both sides got in some good lines, right? Uh, I would even argue that potentially you could argue that on the Chinese side, Yang Jiechi's, you know, his lines were better than uh, than Blinken's lines or Jake Sullivan's lines. Um, but that was performative, and it was performative, I think, both for uh, the U.S. for U.S. domestic audiences and for the Chinese for Chinese domestic audiences. Um, then they had their closed door meeting, which, by you know, what we've heard from outside was not at the same level of sort of performance. It was, it was a little bit more actual dialogue. Um, but what you know, specifically is gonna come out of that, we don't know yet. Um, so I, I tend to think of, I tend to think honestly of the performance side as just sort of fun entertainment. I don't take it that seriously. I am interested to know though, behind closed doors, did they figure out any sort of a sort of a map for what the contours of the relationship are going to be forward and, and how that gets operationalized. And I don't think we have any idea yet. Um, we just have to kind of, you know, watch it and see and see how things develop. Right. Like it would be interesting to know if they found cooperation on any um any topic. I'm sure they did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the question is really, you know, I think we can say at a high level of abstraction that you know, it's, it's useful for the US and China to try to be on the same page vis-a-vis -vis something like climate change, right? You know, I'm sure in the closed door meeting, there were sentences said on both sides that support that at a high level of abstraction. What I think we don't know yet though, is what will that actually mean? You know, in terms of actual, you know, on the ground policymaking, are there ways in which um, they, they can work together and sort of push the ball forward on this larger issue uh, and that's also true of things like North Korea, you know, all, all sorts of other public health, all sorts of other things. And whether that will be possible, even as, you know, we maintain sort of a more contentious relationship on some of the other stuff. So, for example, just to give one concrete example that's not totally, you know, out of the blue, if the Biden administration decides that they want to do a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Olympics, right, which is very plausible. Like, I don't know if they're going to do it, but it's, it's very plausible. If the Biden administration decides they want to do that, because that sends a signal about certain issues they're concerned about, will that be um, possible and then have still space to do, you know, work together productively on some of these other issues? Um, I don't know that anyone knows the answer to that, but it seems as if there would be um, an interest on the part of the Biden administration to have that kind of a dual strategy where there's some things that you are more sort of, you know, you stand up for and sort of in a very sort of forceful way. And then there are other things you work together and those things are siloed off so that they don't mean you can't do one or the other because you're doing one or the other. Right. I think compart compartmentalizing everything is um, key to our relationship with China, right? Um, so- we and, But that's, I mean, I, I and I, that's a great word. I wish I'd use that word. Um, <laughs> There will be people who disagree with that, right? So I think it's I I I I I am trying to be thoughtful about it and to say I do I think a degree of compartmentalization is going to be essential, right? Because it's such a varied relationship and there's so many different aspects to it. And at some level, it's it's not going to work if we if we don't have some level of compartmentalization. But I respect the people. And I know that there will be people who say, no, you can't compartmentalize. It's got to be either one or the other. It's got to be we're working together or we're like fighting each other. You can't kind of do this, this, this mix of things. I get, right. I get that perspective. I just, as I try to be thoughtful about it, I, I don't see anything better than some degree of compartmentalization. Yeah, I, I, I'm with, I, I agree with you. I don't think you can just group everything together and make it a whole package kind of thing. Uh, so we talked about what, uh, like a misconceptions Americans have about China, right? So what do Americans get exactly right about China? That's interesting. I actually thought you were gonna ask me what are Chinese misconceptions about America, which I would <laughs> oh, that's like a good to one too. at some point. <laughs> but um, what Americans get right about China, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, and I think it would be different Americans because not all Americans uh, focus on China you know, enough. 
Um, but I think at a very broad level of abstraction, you know, if you just, if I walked outside of my office here at the University of Pennsylvania and I just found one person on the street and they said, hey, listen, like, what do you think about China? And then I assessed whether what they said was right or not. Um, a broad sense that China has become more powerful on the world stage, that's certainly true, right? You know, there's, there's no question about that. And I think that has broadened, that, that knowledge is like deeply embedded in American sort of public consciousness now. Um, what I think is not as deeply embedded are the vulnerabilities that go along with China's current situation. So I think, you know, the average American probably is not as familiar with, you know, the extreme inequality of wealth, uh, you know, the poverty in certain areas, um, the, 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 the environmental challenges, um, you know, the, the labor unrest, all of those things that those of us who specialize in China are very familiar with, I don't think is, is more broadly understood. But at a broad level, just the notion that China is more powerful and significant on the world stage, sure, I think a lot of people know that. Um, and I think, you know, the, frankly, the, um, the, the degree to which something like what's happening in Xinjiang uh, really raises uh, deep human rights concerns, that, I think, has broken through. And this is something that I always try to convey to my Chinese interlocutors, because I think that's a, that's a big deal, right? So like when I go to my barbershop in Philadelphia and everyone in the barbershop has heard of the plight of the Xinjiang Uyghurs, <laughs> that's not good for uh, you know, China's broader public relations. Um, and and I, think, I think they've gotten that message um, because now they're very aggressively pushing back you know, with things like you know, the ban on cotton or the, you know, the, now they're doing like these musicals about how everyone right. in Xinjiang is like happy and dancing that's not gonna work, right? So right. like at some level, like, you know, if, if they care about their reputation on the global stage, they're going to have to um, change the policy in Xinjiang. Um, otherwise, you know, that message has really sunk in. And, you know, that's just me, I'm just the messenger here. I'm not, you know, I'm not out there, you know, like pushing that. I'm just saying that that's the reality on the ground, not only in the US, but I think in other Western countries too. And you know, if I was on the Chinese side, I would think that that's a problem and that, you know, uh, it's, it would be, a, it behoove, uh, you know, to, to take a different approach that wouldn't generate that kind of reaction. I love that you mentioned um, the fact that um, like American and Western media doesn't sufficiently uh, cover like the negatives of China, right? Because if they did, it would, um, make China seem less intimidating and I think, you know, make it so China's less scary to the average American. And then you have like more support for um, cooperation with China, right? So yeah, so that's I, would, I would amend that slightly. I I'm generally agree with your insight. I do think there is a lot of excellent reporting um, that just doesn't, you know, the reporting that people like me pay very close attention to, but maybe doesn't get the wider readership on, on some of these types of challenges, you know, and I think that's true of all the different outlets. But I would say that there has been this phenomenon in, in the recent time of uh, China kicking out uh, many of the foreign reporters. Um, and, uh, you know, that's also, it's a tit for tat thing. So there's some Chinese reporters who have been kicked out. And so there's, you know, that, that's a dynamic that I also think is very problematic. Um, and, and especially, I think, because it's so important to have Western reporters on the ground giving us this broader picture of what's happening that includes, as you just said, the reporting about the, the, the vulnerabilities you know, that, that are important to know about. But I also think when people are on the ground reporting, um, they write with, with a degree of empathy. Um, and I think that's very, you know, I, I, I'm very interested in this notion of critical empathy, of, of being critical because you need to be critical and you need to be critical of everything, but including of a country as strong and powerful as China, but doing it from a perspective of empathy makes a big difference in, in terms of the strength of the critique and the way in which the, the recipient gets the critique. And, and um, so having reporters on the ground writing critically, but with a degree of empathy that is, is inherent in being on the ground, um, that, that's really important. And, and I think that's a huge loss for China itself that they're not making it possible for the reporters to do those kinds of stories. Because if the reporters can only do stories from Hong Kong or Taiwan or Singapore, <laughs> they are going to tend to write about right. the things that are more visible on the surface level, which are going to, again, feed more into this narrative of, oh, China's so scary and China's bad and, you know, we should all be terrified of China. 
Right. No, I, I completely agree. You're right. It's kind of counterproductive um, to, to not have journalists cover uh, China because, you know, you, you're you right. It, you when, when you're there and you're with the people, um, you know, you, you get that sense like, hey, they're, they're, they're just like me, right? Uh, they're just going about their lives. They're not these like evil, horrible people. So I, I completely agree with you on that. Um, I, you know, thank you for sharing all your insights. I know you're super busy, so I don't want to take up any more of your time. Yeah. I just have one more question for you. Um, so you have a lot of exciting things going on. Um, would you like to tell us um, like about any other projects that you're working on or um, other like passions that, that you're, you know, that you have that you're like, uh, you know, like turning into projects um, moving forward. I think I really just want to just reemphasize the, the podcast of the Center for the Study of Contemporary China. Um, I have a bunch of really good episodes recorded that I'm going to start releasing on a weekly basis uh, and, you know, just really terrific conversation. So I, I hope people will subscribe to it. And then something that I'm going to start doing uh, with this new episode that I'll post later this week is I'm going to start doing chats with the guests from the episodes on the new Clubhouse platform. So I'll post an episode, and then a few days later, I'll have a chat with that guest on Clubhouse, which will be a chance for you know people who've listened to the episode to um, kind of weigh in and say this is how I reacted to it, and ask further questions, and give the guest from that episode a chance to maybe say a little bit more about how the topic has evolved since the time that we uh, that we had that conversation. I've I've been I found it really rewarding how much people have liked the podcast how much people have liked you know, hearing these like long in-depth conversations. And I get, you know, all sorts of feedback on Twitter and email and stuff like that. And I'm really excited to then actually engage with people more directly through this, you know, audio drop-in uh, mechanism of Clubhouse and, and really have that, that exchange kind of go to a new level. Uh, so that's, that's really what I'm going to be pretty uh, focused on in, in the coming months. That's a really great marketing strategy for your podcast because I'm on, on Clubhouse. I moderate some of the um, rooms and it is a fantastic way to connect with people that, you know, you would never um, connect with. And there are such fascinating people on there with yeah. like amazing credentials and so knowledgeable. So, um, you know, I can't wait to see, you know, the links to the Clubhouse on your Twitter. I will certainly be joining and listening to that and we'll include all the links to um, everything that you mentioned Great. in our description. And uh, yeah. Please was... uh, emphasize, so the podcast, the Penn Project on the Future of us China Relations, mm -hmm. and also the, the volumes of the Penn Asian Law Review on Chinese Administrative Law. So volume one's been published a couple of years ago and volume two is gonna be coming out later this spring. I think it's amazing that there's an entire law review dedicated to China. That's like unfathomable to me, like 10 years ago, to yeah. like that, for that to even happen. So that's very, very cool. Um, so thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was great having you here today. Thanks, and, Angel. No, not at all. And we hope you will come back and join us with updates in the future. <laughs> sure, I'd love uh, to. This was fun. Yeah, absolutely. So to our viewers out there, uh, we hope you enjoyed this show and we hope to see you next time right here on Second Gen's Liberated Panda. Bye, everyone. Bye.